title of my sermon is The Grave Danger of Spiritual Sluggishness. Sluggishness. We've all been there. We're walking with God, but we've stopped striving and started strolling. We only open our Bibles to feel like a good Christian for the day. Sermons go in one ear and out the other. And maybe we have an excuse. Suffering. It's hard to suffer and not feel sluggish. That would have gotten amens from the original hearers of the letter to the Hebrews. Read through Hebrews and you'll get a picture of a congregation under persecution. And their suffering is causing them to look back at their life before Christ and think, that was easier. And they'd be right. But they haven't left Jesus, haven't left the church, but sluggishness might just be here to stay. Have you become content with spiritual sluggishness, with going through the motions of the Christian life? Whether you feel sluggish today, you will feel sluggish in the future. And your Heavenly Father loves you too much to let you stay there without warning. That's why this passage we're about to read exists, to warn the spiritually sluggish of grave danger. To give you some context of what we're about to read, in the previous chapter, the writer of Hebrews wants to talk about Melchizedek, but he knows his audience won't be on the edge of their seats like they should be. And so he pauses his Bible lesson to confront them about being dull of hearing. You should be Bible teachers by now, he says. But can't, he can't even trust them to pay attention during his sermon. And so he accuses them of being spiritual children. Oof. He calls them to go on to maturity. And at that, he could have started, preach he could have started preaching about Melchizedek like he wanted to. He's got his hearer's attention. But he doesn't circle back just yet. He needs them to know how high the stakes are in them going on to maturity. And so he hits them with the warning in Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 12. Read along with me there. Why should we be determined to go on to maturity? For it is impossible, in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age have come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for His name in serving the saints, as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. What is the grave danger of spiritual sluggishness that threatens us if we do not go on to maturity? God warns us, if you're not striving after Christ today, you might not be able to tomorrow. We as humans tend to think tomorrow will always be there, and I'll have the heart to do XYZ tomorrow, but you might not be able to tomorrow 
because of the danger in verses 4 to 6. The author of Hebrews builds suspense about what this danger is by announcing in verse 4, it is impossible, and then listing the conditions that create the impossibility. Once been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, etc. If you experience these things and then turn away from Jesus, verse 6 says, repentance becomes impossible since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. That's why if you're not striving after Christ today, you might not be able to tomorrow because it's impossible to taste and see that Christ is good, spit Him out, and then repent. Now you may have 10,000 questions about that, which is understandable, so let's take them one at a time. First off, is he saying, I can lose my salvation? What is he describing in verses 4 to 5? I submit to you that he's not describing a born-again Christian, but allow me to prove myself. I admit sharing the Holy Spirit sure sounds saved. But you can resolve every seeming contradiction in the Bible by asking this question. What does the author mean by that? What does the author of Hebrews mean by share in the Holy Spirit? That phrase comes in a list in verses 4 to 5. Look with me at the verbs in that list. Enlightened. Tasted the heavenly gift. Shared in the Holy Spirit. Tasted the goodness of the Word of God and powers of the age to come. The author is listing experiences, not identities. He's not saying who his hearers are. He's saying what they've done. This all becomes clear if you zoom out further in the letter. In the first five chapters of Hebrews, the author keeps making an example out of the Israelites. These are people who were enlightened with the Ten Commandments and tasted the heavenly gift of manna. And yet when God wanted to give them the promised land, what did they want? They wanted to scamper back to slavery in Egypt. Those Israelites experienced God speaking and acting, but they never had faith. And so they fell away and died in the wilderness. Okay, but in what way can those without faith share in the Holy Spirit? The author of Hebrews mentions the Spirit twice prior to our passage. And both are related to God speaking, not saving. Hebrews 2.4, God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. In Hebrews 3.7, as the Holy Spirit says... Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. By sharing in the Holy Spirit, then, the author of Hebrews means sharing in revelation, not regeneration. If the Holy Spirit reveals the gospel of Jesus Christ to you, and you hear Christ's death and resurrection preached, and you see in the gospels that He's full of grace and truth, and you witness His power to change a people from selfish to sacrificial in the church. If you experience all that goodness and still turn away from Jesus, verse 6 doesn't say you lose your salvation. It says you lose the chance for salvation, which is worse. You have decided to follow Satan. No turning back. No turning back. If that scares you, you're listening well. The author of Hebrews needs his hearers to know that spiritual sluggishness is not safe because sluggishness today leaves the door open for falling away tomorrow. And falling away after tasting and seeing that Christ is good is spitting him out. 
well-informed, falling away, is crucifying Christ afresh. It's hearing of the blood he shed for you in love and telling him to get back up there. It's hearing his lavish promise of eternal life and saying, nah, I'll take this world, thank you. A heart that knows Christ's heart and yet holds him up to contempt and shames him publicly is a heart too hard to change its mind. What do we do with this teaching? We live with a healthy fear. Believers don't need to fear God's judgment, but they do need to fear themselves and the self-deception their sinful hearts are capable of. Hebrews 4.1 says, Let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach God's rest. None of us are above that. None of us. Many of you may not be sluggish today by God's grace. Hallelujah. Do you have the courage to warn the sluggish around you like the author of Hebrews does? Hebrews 3.13 says, Exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. If we sense sluggishness in a fellow church member about the things of God, love looks like encouraging them today toward all God has for them in Christ. It's urgent, because if you don't encourage them today, they might not be able to be encouraged tomorrow. Does this all mean if someone stops following Jesus, we should stop praying for them? No, because we don't know when it's become impossible for someone to repent. We cannot see hearts, so we cannot know if someone has actually experienced the conditions in verses 4 to 5. Nor do we know if someone has fully fallen away unless they've denounced Jesus. So in a sense, ignorance is bliss. We should always continue to pray for the restoration of others in hopes they know not what they do. And we should pray with urgency today, lest we pray in vain for a hardened heart tomorrow. In verses 4 to 6 come, came the warning. Verses 7 and 8 state the reason for the warning. Why is it impossible to taste and see that Christ is good, spit him out, and then repent? The author answers this question with an illustration. He says in verse 7, For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it, and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, It is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. In this parable, we are the land. And the rain that often falls on that land, what does that sound like? It sounds like being enlightened and tasting the heavenly gift, etc. And often the rain has fallen on this land. A riddle for you. What is land supposed to do when it's been well nourished with rain? It's supposed to produce a crop. Likewise, if God is showering you with spiritual nourishment, it's supposed to bear fruit. But if land is well nourished with rain and bears thorns and thistles, what does that say about the land? There's something wrong with the land. That's the reason it's impossible to taste and see that Christ is good, spit him out, and then repent. Because something is wrong with the heart that does that. It's become hardened, rocky soil. And if God banned the Israelites from the promised land, 
for bearing thorns and thistles. How much more for us who know better than they did. If enlightenment that Israel's God was Yahweh was expected to bear fruit, how much more enlightenment from Jesus, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, if tasting the heavenly gift of manna was supposed to produce trust in the Israelites, how much more the bread of life that came down from heaven. The Israelites shared in the Holy Spirit's guidance by cloud and fire. That's cool. We rub shoulders with people indwelled by the Holy Spirit who is remaking them into the likeness of Christ himself. The Israelites tasted the goodness of the law and the power that would conquer the promised land. We've tasted the goodness of grace and truth and the power that will conquer the world. It makes sense then why the author of Hebrews would be concerned with lack of fruit when we on, si on this side of the resurrection have been showered with spiritual nourishment. To whom much is given, much is required. Consider the amount of nourishment God has showered you with and let it awaken you from your sluggishness. You hear Jesus Christ and Him crucified preached every week. You attend a church with people who love God and one another every week. You live in 2024, and so you have a privilege unknown to the original audience of Hebrews and the rest of the New Testament. You carry everything God wants humanity to know about himself and the world around in your pocket. On top of all that, God placed some of us in families that were telling us about Jesus in our mother's womb. How hard-hearted do we have to be to bear thorns and thistles after all that nourishment? How fair would God be to curse us if we forfeit all we've been offered? At this point in the passage, you may be asking what I think the original audience would have been asking. If I'm spiritually sluggish, does that mean you think I'll be cursed? Do, do you think my end is to be burned? In the remainder of our passage, the author of Hebrews puts his hand on the shoulder, on our shoulder, and assures us spiritual sluggishness is not safe, but it's not the end. The end of some is to be burned, but he says in verse 9, Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things things that belong to salvation. And why does he feel this way in spite of their sluggishness? Verse 10, For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. Why should you be sure of your salvation, O sluggish believer? Because God is not unjust. That's a clunky way to put it, with a double negative, not unjust. Why not say, God is just to see your work? Because his point isn't that God is just to save them based on their work. His point is they are producing a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated. And God blesses land like that. He is not unjust to shower you with spiritual nourishment and look the other way as you bear fruit, also we can curse you. No, God has seen every glass of water you have given a saint in love for him. All the ways you serve when no one is watching, 
maybe ways you feel unappreciated for, God sees. And what does that make me want to do? It makes me want to keep going, to keep loving God by serving others. And just in case you haven't been, the author of Hebrews says in verse 11, and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have full assurance of hope until the end. So you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Assurance of salvation is always rooted in Jesus Christ crucified and resurrection and His promise that everyone who believes in Him has eternal life. But to have full assurance takes earnestness that gospel reign necessarily produces. And what does that earnestness look like? Maybe you're thinking, I am sluggish for a reason. Suffering has depleted me. How earnest do I have to be to have full assurance of hope to the end? As if the Holy Spirit knows this sobering warning would cause fear and trembling. He doesn't describe earnestness in verse 12 like we would expect. What would we expect him to contrast sluggishness with? Do not be sluggish, but be strong. The opposite of sluggish is swift, energized, mounting up on wings like eagles. But because your Father knows your frame, He knows the spiritually sluggish have a hard time getting off the ground. And so He gives us something that's more our speed. Do not be sluggish, but imitate. Be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Show up to church. Linger afterward and talk to people. When you hear someone express faith and patience, keep watching that person and imitate them. That, my friends, is the great secret of not falling away, of shaking off spiritual sluggishness, of securing full assurance, of even becoming the Bible teacher you're meant to be. Imitate people who are waiting for Jesus to do what He promised. And while you wait, love God by serving those you're waiting with. And drink deeply the Word of God like your farmland in need of rain. What an easy yoke and light burden. Just what we would expect from a merciful and faithful high priest who knows how to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward. The grave danger of spiritual sluggishness is that if you're not feasting on Christ today, you might not be able to tomorrow. And so let us imitate those who feast until we inherit eternal rest where sluggishness will be no more, and it will be impossible to stop tasting and seeing that Christ is good. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that even in hard words, uh, you love us enough to assure us of salvation. Thank you that you even desire to assure us of salvation. Um, may you grant us all wisdom um, in applying this passage to our lives and making this sermon better for the feeding of your flock. In Jesus' name, amen.
I appreciate your mercy on uh, the timer. <laughs> I was like, I'm a maker now. Oh, I have no sermon time. No, 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 no. I mean, uh, how, uh, how long the sermon usually going? I usually preach 30, 35 minutes. My senior pastor, though, sometimes goes for 40, 45, so I have flexibility. Oh, okay. So I, I'm actually the, I'm the, I'm the shorter preacher, typically, of the church. Because yeah, of the way Simeon Trust has trained me. What was something that encouraged you as you uh, prepared this? I think the, right, I, at the moment, by God's grace, I don't feel spiritually sluggish. And so I was, my wife asked me, like, how, how are you applying what you're studying to your walk with God? I was like, I don't know. And so it just, that's what made me come up with, like, oh, I need to have the courage as a pastor to be able to, like, ch like challenge, warn my congregants um, who may be sluggish. That's just something that, yeah, I struggle with. Like, when when is the right time to confront sin and how hard? And so I think this was a good, seeing how he did it, which is this interesting, like, ability to say very hard word and yet, yet simultaneously comfort them with salvation was a, was a, yeah, something that was helpful to put in the pastoral toolbox. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting, right? Like, uh, even uh, when I picked up Pastor Dan from the airport, we were talking about, like, uh, maybe it's not spe specifically sluggishness, but, uh, like, just lately, I, I, I'm just, like, struggling to go and meet up with people and visit them. And I don't feel like I'm being sluggish. I'm doing a bunch of stuff. But there's always areas in which been like just so I, I think that kind of gets to what you're what you're saying too like we might not feel sluggish but there's something we should uh, examine about ourselves there too right so that's good let's go around and uh, give David some encouragement let's uh, start with Bosco and go around encouragement mm -hmm. uh, okay one of the encouragement I think you uh, you're doing it like a verse by verse so I do not lose it where you are. So you very clearly state where where you where you preaching. Hallelujah. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, I was encouraged that you realize your congregate how your congregation might be thinking about this, and you wanted to address this question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very pastoral. You know, you know the people. Here are questions that are probably on your mind. 
I don't think they were just general. I think they were just he was genuinely thinking about the congregation as well. Yeah. I I found it very useful that um, the way you had structured your sermon came through in your presentation. Hmm. So it was it was not that hard to to follow as you even like would mention like you know for six we saw a warning and now we're going you know seven to eight to the reason for the warning. Um, and then 9-11, uh, I, I don't know, I think I might have missed your, your heading there. I don't, I don't know if I gave one, um, if, if that's allowed. Um. <laughs> well, we're trying to give you encouragement, so I'm just saying uh -huh. like, oh, yeah, yeah, it yeah. was noticeable yeah, yeah, yeah. That, like, where you had your, 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 uh, your homiletical outline. Right? Uh -huh. that, was, that was useful, it helped to, to track Uh, wait, are we on? Before, oh, wait, we were encouraged, or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, we are encouraged, or how uh, is the encouragement? Uh, is the number 10, in what way did the sermon most encourage you? So uh, okay. Okay. Encourage us. Oh. No. Yeah. Okay, I was, I was just encouraged to, to not be sluggish. Um, hmm. I was, I was convinced of the main point of just, you know, especially being up here, it, can be easy to get sluggish. Hmm. I'm like, man, I've looked at the Bible a lot. I'm looking at it all the time. I'm like, I'm good. Uh, and to be sluggish to actually not practice the spiritual, like practice spiritual disciplines. Uh, hmm. So I, I was, I was uh, encouraged, convicted in that of, of just not not being sluggish on those things. Just be, you know, because I'm the student of the Bible, but actually being a a disciple of Christ. Mm -hmm. and, Practitioner of the Bible. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, move on then uh, to question eleven. Uh, how do you feel you can improve if you had to preach this again? You are going to preach this again at your church. So, how how what's something that just jumps out at you that you need to improve on? Um. Let's see. I think I could have probably uh, maybe hammered home. The, I think I lost the big idea maybe in the third point um, until the end. So maybe I could have hit on more repetition for the, the main idea. I wonder also if it would be helpful to like... I was restrained by word count, but like nuance, spiritual sluggishness more. Um, like, what do I mean by that? Is it just like a tired, or is it like, right, I don't think what go, is going on in Hebrews is just like tired, or uh, my wife brought up spiritual depression by Lloyd Jones is like where it's more uh, amoral. Um, and so, just to, so people with tender consciences don't put themselves in this box that they need warned when they don't. Maybe I need something in there that's like, this isn't talking about you. Um, or at least what should they think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Um, I, I don't see a gospel connection. Clear gospel connection. Maybe I missed it, but uh, I don't see um, all, the whole sermon is about don't be sluggish. So it's more like it tells us what to do, but how how gospel contribute over here? I, I don't see a clear connection. Okay. Um, I don't know. Maybe you said it, but I wasn't sure. What if I'm sitting in the pew and I think this is written to those who are believers? Uh, you stated it that this is not to believers. Um, this is a warning not to people that are genuinely converted, that have heard and experienced these things. Um, we know. Uh, 
there, yeah. So I, I just, I wondered if sort of people might need to be spoken to sort of. Do you think? Spoken to genuine believers? Yeah. No, do you think those in the pew who think it may be to a, a true warning to those who are converted, but a fair warning anyway, do you think they need to be, is there a way to kind of show why you're convinced this is written for those who um, have not experienced saving faith? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, even your question makes me think. I think I tried to avoid converted, non-converted categories, okay. um, but maybe I, I could have been clear, like, right, because he is warning the Hebrew church, mm-hmm. but he's focusing on yeah. how, um, more about their fruit yeah. than, um, man, wow, yeah, I got to really wrestle with, like, how do I make that distinction? Yeah, because I think, I guess my point is, once I, once you said, um, he's not describing a true Christian or you know, after you came from the question can I lose my salvation he's not describing a Christian but someone who has had what does he mean by sharing my faith mm-hmm. spirit I kind of felt like off the hook mm-hmm. huh mm-hmm. yeah um, that's, that's and, I'm curious too. okay yeah. specifically the Holy Spirit part is where I... no not necessarily just the, or in that general area I just feel like kind of began speaking about those who had tasted of the revelation that had not um, been converted or had not been uh, reconciled or something like uh, that. Regenerated. Regenerated. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you you referred to like the whole like experience versus identity thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. also a real hope towards the end uh, but it also made me wonder like uh, like what the think person is, is the author trying to get to as he's writing to these Hebrews and what this think person should we be referring to in our church as we might have sluggish believers and they might almost look like non-believers and we might have uh, uh, people who are non-believers that look like uh, like they're they're believing because they're still with us and they're following along. So I think that's connected to uh, kind of what Dan was saying too. It's just like really clarify uh, who is this talking to? Uh, what are the differences? Uh, and trying to help I think your people identify themselves. Uh, yeah, I kind of kind of building on that. I would let the fear factor linger more. Mm-hmm. If I were you, does that make sense? Like, I think at, at least in up to verse nine, there is supposed to be like this 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 weight of like, and, and yeah, making it clear. I think of and kind of like what Dan was saying, like this. this this is to you. Like, this is to you uh, out there who are sitting there. You, you've maybe grown up in the church, maybe converted later in life. You're confident in your faith, which is fantastic. And, and this is coming from someone who's like, I've struggled a lot with assurance of salvation. Mm-hmm. And I had to wrestle with these passages and get to the other side of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I, think, I think it's okay to let people get into that place of wrestling. And then, in verse 9, I think that's where the hope comes in. Because he says, Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. Um, and so, like, he, he, he does see you, uh, and that, that you would show the same earnestness to have the, the full assurance of hope until the end. So, like, comforting them maybe later on. 
in the end. That that's just the tip I thought. Mm -hmm. And let it yeah, let the fear factor win here. One more round on the um, um yeah. Uh I think this is connected because I don't see what's your main point. Mm. Okay, you, you didn't you, you give us a title. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I know it's something to do with Scots and classical uh, sluggish, but you do not you kind of continue to say sluggish, sluggish, but I, I don't see how the, kind of like, I don't see how the sluggish connecting to the warning or uh, later on uh, for the for the comforting parts, helping parts. So, and so that's why um, I wrote another one, uh, I think it's connected, it's like you're going all over the place on Hebrews. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more like for me, it's more like oh, you're preaching a, you're preaching a thing, instead of preaching the text, preaching the thing. I mean, it's it's okay to preach a preaching a thing, but you know, uh, yeah, it, it kind of like it point me to Hebrew previously, uh, like uh, chapter three or later on somewhere in the, I remember maybe chapter ten or something. But it, it's like all over the place, mm -hmm. and it's like oh, okay, well. Uh, yeah, I think it would have been very useful to to back up what Bach was saying to to have a main argument yeah. that you can continue to point to yeah. that you're hanging things on and to go through like there's a warning, there's a reason for the warning, and there's a hope maybe that we have. But um, I don't remember hearing the the last uh, of the points, but but having a, a main point, a main argument, would have, would have helped you a lot, and would help anybody who hears it to, to detract from the study. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just to re-emphasize what Bach just said. Okay. Yeah, I don't know um, if you picked up in your study on this, but it continues with the thought I had, but um, on the pronouns in the section, so in like verses one, two, three, it's us and we, but from verse four down through eight, it's those, mm. and then it comes back to we, oh, sorry, uh, you, right, verses nine through 11 in that hope section, so, um, I don't know, pointing that out may be helpful to discern what we've been trying to talk about earlier, is that there may be those in this congregation, or I mean, those who are being addressed, not those outside this congregation, but those um, who've had this experience that you're talking about, but then, yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't know what to do with that. But well, just to add a, a, a question to piggyback off on, on your comment, do you, do you think the author is saying this because he's afraid that might happen? Or because that has already happened, and they've experienced it, and might be tempted to follow. I think he thinks if they don't go on to maturity, mm -hmm. this is the consequence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but based on everything he sees right now, sure of salvation, mm -hmm. but. If you get lax, this is what happens. Um, so, so I think there's a tension that like doesn't right fit like neatly into our heads, but there's just like yeah, it's more conditional. Um, so it almost seems like let us uh, uh, kind of lead to falling away, and they probably can yeah. That. Continuing to persevere in the midst of everything, and I think those uh, we and them and the yous are important to help us kind of you know, see it. Um, yeah, there was something I, I noticed. It's a small thing, like you were going at it, and then you would say etc. Mm -hmm. And it it was kind of distracting. Okay. Then, like, okay, what other thing was he like maybe referring to? 
I mean, like, you don't need to say everything, right? You need to say, like, whatever is most, in more, most important to the, mm -hmm. to the point of your, of your argument from the text. So it's like, you don't, you don't need to say et cetera. You just, like, cut it, cut it out, like, maybe whatever you're trying to say, use a, a clear, succinct example, and, like, move on. Yeah, the, the those, those were both in reference to that list of enlightened, tasted, and so uh, it ended up getting long if I repeated all those, but yeah, I'll okay. find a smoother way to shorten yeah. that. So maybe what, what's a way we can summarize that Yeah. That, that's helpful yeah. to your people as you're preaching? Because when you say et cetera, it kind of leaves me like thinking about the list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think yeah, you mentioned uh, that you didn't label like that those last verses nine through twelve. Mm -hmm. um, I I think you should just because mm -hmm. the note. I like I'm I'm always gonna have the perspective of a note taker. Mm -hmm. um, the note takers will be driven crazy if like they won't, they won't pay attention to what you're saying if you just say nine to twelve say this and you don't give a like if you don't. That's just my opinion. Like, I could be distracted. It's, it's not even just that. Like, that's a valid thing, but your sub points or, or your homiletical points are, should be pointing to your main argument. Yeah. So it's not just helpful for the note takers, it's helpful for your listeners to be making sense of the whole. So that's, that's a helpful one. Okay, so David, what are, what are some things or just like one thing that you felt you did really well? Um, I don't know about really well, but um, well enough. I think my, I felt comfortable with the pace. Mm -hmm. I think I have a tendency to talk very fast. Okay. And so I felt like I may have been slow at times, which, yeah. Um, so I was pleased with that. I was curious about that because I've never heard you preach before. And I was wondering, I, like, I've talked to you before, obviously. And, uh, and I was wondering, it, it felt a little slow at times. Okay. But, I, but it, I also was wondering if you were doing that purposely or, or like, is that something you're working on, just on your pace? And your, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Awesome. Uh, I think you did a clear explanation on your you know, apostasy part, mm. and then you didn't uh, experience with identity. So, uh, yeah, I think that, that one made something clear over there. I also thought um, you used some word pictures and references to other things Jesus has said, mm. stony hard, stuff like that, mm. without having to take us into a long mm. connection. That was very good and kind of reinforced by using that biblical language. I don't know if you're doing that intentionally, but those biblical quotes were not to the drive of images, but also just the authority to bring that home. So that was really good. I thought your use of context was, was, was good to situate us in the present moment of the text. Um, I, as somebody had mentioned before, like maybe we have too much at times. But especially at the beginning, I felt it really like brought us into the um, into the text. You know? Yeah, I I think your delivery was really well. Like you, you just spoke very clearly and confidently, uh, and it was easy to listen to. Um, and, and and I do, it, I I didn't notice you were going slow just because beforehand you told me you would probably be speaking fast. So I was like, oh, he's speaking at a good pace. So I thought the pace was good. Because, probably because you, you told me, you were going to like, he's speaking fast. But the whole time, like, there weren't any parts where you were, like, speeding. And I, so I thought it was a good pace, personally. Uh, you have a lot of good applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like, because, I think it's because you're doing verse by verse, so every verse you, you give the application. Yeah, that's, I, I get something from my pr uh, prayers and you know many things. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think 
for no explanation of playing games. Carry on to my point so far. Okay. Um, why did my mute forget it? Oh, sorry. Something else that you did well. Um, even though you didn't have like a main point per se, uh, yeah, I think I walk away just going, don't be sluggish, like, and understanding that a little bit better. Um, and I think uh, your earnestness came through, that you that you are really warning me hmm. out of this care, uh, that I don't fall away, but that I persevere in, in following Je in Jesus. And, and, and that that's that's not it's not nothing, you know. It's uh, it's important that our people also feel that this is something that matters to you, so it should matter to me. And um, yeah, so it just threw out that uh, emphasis of persevering and also hopefulness at the end. Yeah, um, I I was I was actually going to mention that. Like you mentioned the sluggish sluggard thing a lot. And I think that was helpful because e even though there wasn't a point, like I didn't even I didn't realize until it was pointed out that you didn't give like a a thesis type main point because the main point was was kind of evident in what you were saying. But it was like, hey, don't be sluggard, like don't be sluggish. Um, and so I I kind of like looking back at my notes, I was like, oh, I guess he didn't like explicitly mention something, but I I did. I do think it was so helpful the way you formed it by saying don't be sluggish so many times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got the hint. Okay. Um, well, you said at one point toward the end, what does earnestness look like? Peter doesn't describe it in a way that we might expect. And it piqued my interest. I was like, okay, I would agree. You know what I mean? And so I just thought that was good reading of the word and good use of the things we're learning. grab your audience's attention, you know, with your hearers as you're wrapping up the sermon, you really make your point um, in the cadence, so, yeah, that was helpful, yeah. They had good descriptors along the way, that being one of them, so, thank you, Mr. Damon. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Amen. Amen. Bless it. And may the Lord bless this word to the church. Yes. Thank you.